sir. We're good to go. Also, um, Councilmember Yarbrough sent her, um, she's traveling tonight, I think. Oh, everybody saw it. Great. Okay. Let's call to order the uh, Monday, September 9th, 2024, Transportation Advisory Board for the City of Longmont. Um, let's do a roll call, please. Chair Lehner. Here. Board Member Bennett. Present. Board Member Wicklin. Here. Vice Chair McKay Burroughs. Yeah. Board Member McInerney. Present. Board Member Kalkoffer. Here. Board Member Kim. Here. Fantastic. Um, for the benefit of board member Wickland, we're going to do introductions again. <laughs> should we go around the room or should we just do the one new member? You can also do introductions where you say a little bit more about your background. Because <laughs> we really missed that last time was giving Alex any idea of kind of where you're from and what you, you know, what your background is. Alex, why don't you go ahead? Sure. I'm Alex Kalkoffer. I've been in Longmont since 2008. I'm on the I'm on two boards, uh, including this one, uh, the Elks Lodge here in Longmont, as well as Community Action for Boulder County. Happy to be here. My name is Garrison Bennett, and I am a transportation enthusiast who is also a special education teacher and occasionally a rideshare driver. Uh, I'm Taylor Wicklin, uh, born and raised here in town. Uh, I have spent some stints away, at least. Um, but uh, yeah, I've been a board member for, this is two, a little more than two years now. And then also chair of the Bike Issues Committee and uh, co-founder of Launch Longline Housing. Gina McKee Burrs, uh, this is my second year on TAB, and I am from England, in case no one noticed my accent. <laughs> um, I have lived in Longmont since 2019, Colorado since 2012, and I am a big bike enthusiast. That is my main form of, of uh, commuting, so I'm all about bikes. I'm Steve Lehner, uh, been a board member now for, this is the beginning of my second term, I think that's correct. I guess I'll say I'm a concerned citizen, um, cyclist, pedestrian, and motorist, so I guess I use all modes, um, and even a little bit of uh, public transit when I can. Um, that's about it, about me. <clears throat> I'm David McInerney, I'm in my fourth year as a board member. I became interested in the board when I read the Envision Longmont Multimodal and Comprehensive Plan. I decided that the plan presents a positive direction for Longmont's future, and I wanted to help to implement it. Hi, um, I'm Nick Kim. I've been in Longmont since 2022. I am an avid walker. I work from home, so I love just walking around the uh, southeast side of Longmont. And yeah, I'm excited to be here. Okay, um, let's uh, get any comments and move to approving the minutes of the preceding meeting from August. Uh, any questions or comments on the minutes from the August meeting? Okay, um, we can get a motion to approve those minutes. We can move on. I will motion to approve the minutes from August 2024. Seconded. All those in favor say aye. 
Aye. Aye. Opposed? No? Okay. And we'll move on to number five, communication from staff. Great, thank you very much. Phil Greenwald, Transportation Planning Manager with the city. Just wanted to let you know, first of all, that Spring Gulch Trail opening, it's uh, ready to roll. It's good to good to be all connected. I wrote it on Friday with my counterpart from the city of Boulders who wanted, who wanted to see what we're doing here in Longmont. So that was exciting. Uh, it was a wonderful trail, a lot of great comments, positive comments. And so we're excited to finally get that link from the Greenway through Sandstone Ranch, which is a very popular place for kids to play all sorts of different activities and games and things. So, uh, and then we've got that connected up through the school, uh, through a middle school near there, middle elementary. And so, um, and into Jim's neighborhood. So we've got a connection for Jim to get right onto the trail now. So that's good. Um, it's your favorite path, right? You Spring you know Gulch. <laughs> it's probably best. Good. Um, as you also saw, there is, uh, we do have a micro transit vendor finally. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at Ms. Uh, Board Member McInerney. Uh, so finally this morning I had a signed contract, so I was able to finally get the word out that VIA Transportation, capital VIA, not um, our VIA mobility folks that also provide paratransit service, but uh, we're hoping it'll be a good um, relationship between the two um, as hopefully we'll be picking up some of those trips from um, older people with the microtransit and um, they can focus more on the paratransit piece of that. So we're excited. I sent you all a link to um, the website, their website, and their specific issues about microtransit. So hopefully I'll take a look at that when you get a chance. Uh, I know that was probably sent about 4 o'clock this afternoon, so a lot of you didn't probably see it, but I wanted to make sure you had that connection. And then um, just want to let you know about an air show on Saturday. Make sure you know that Part of my duties are also transportation planning and airport. So um, the airport is having a, it's kind of marquee event. It hasn't happened for about um, four or five years now because of COVID. So we're excited to get people back out to the airport and see what, what they're doing out there. And, and so those are, those are exciting things. And then I wanted to invite Cami to come up and just talk a little bit about where we are on the Vision Zero process and what those next steps are. So Cami, if you don't mind. Here we go. Um, hello, board members. I have two pieces of what I hope you'll find is good news. The first is SS4A grant that we applied for back in April for $1.2 million. We found out a few days ago we were awarded. So hopefully that means we are, yeah, under contract and with the feds by mid next year. We don't know how long it's going to take. It's been taking other communities about a year to complete the contracting process. But in the meantime, it's not going to slow our work with Vision Zero. We're going to go ahead and do a lot of the work in prep for the action plan. So by the time we get a consultant on board, they can just kind of tie it up and finish it off for us. And so part of that will be funding a camera project that I believe Kyle will be mentioning early or later tonight, um, a site distance study, and then our action plan. So good things to come. And then coupled with that is we are going to be launching the Vision Zero Task Force. So the first meeting is going to be in October. We're working with our communications team with the city right now to coordinate the announcement, the public announcement about the opportunities to get involved in Vision Zero with the grant award. So all of that should be coming out in the next couple of weeks about how we're moving forward and ways to get involved. So you should be seeing that. So those are my two updates, Vision Zero Task Force launching, and we got some good money to spend coming up. So thank you. Any questions about those? No? Okay, great. Thank you. Sorry, that's it from staff. Thank you. Okay, um, it does not look like we have any public here invited to be heard. And uh, luckily, no action items this meeting, as opposed to last meeting. So we'll move on to the information items. Kyle, I think you're up next. There we go. So I'm Kyle Howarth. I'm the Traffic Engineering Administrator, say Lama. So I handle all the traffic signal systems and operations within the city. I'm very excited to 
present some information tonight regarding our new Travis signal upgrade. Um, staff have been working on this for about last year and finally able to demonstrate some of the capabilities and updates from our previous system. So breaking up our department, um, this is just one section of what traffic engineering does. Um, this will be the uh, traffic signal operations portion of our department. Um, basically, we broke them down into three separate parts that all come down into our uh, advanced traffic signal uh, performance measures. If you've seen some literature before, a ATSPM is a big hot word in kind of uh, technology shows and uh, how products are conveyed to cities of how can we improve transportation within your city. Um, I've broken down into three separate options. One is signal operations, so how um, the signals work on a day-to-day -day basis, it's reliability, and more of the logistics of keeping the maintenance and durability of the system going. Uh, another section is vehicular and multi-mile flow. So that'd be how we move vehicles from point A to point B, as well as we're moving to Vision Zero, putting more emphasis on multimodal, as well as in the future, bus rapid transit. Uh, the last piece is safety and uh, data analytics. So how do we utilize this system to tell us how the city's functioning, um, what improvements can be made, and also can we identify any um, issues preemptively and make those corrections to avoid any future um, accidents or collisions. So what else goes in a traffic signal? Um, often people think it's just a little computer that says red, yellow, green, and that's it. That can't be farther from the truth. Um, there are several pieces um, in the graphic you see there. Um, these are just a portion of some of the technology we utilize in our traffic signals. Um, but today I'm gonna simplify it. We'll keep it to um, number eight, which is the lower left bu bubble, which is our controller, which sits inside our traffic cabinet. So we see some steel boxes on the side of the road. That's our traffic cabinet. Um, that is the computer of the system. It handles the timing and coordination and also gives us the real-time status of each signal, um, as well as monitor monitors equipment for faults. The second piece is number 10. It's the top bu red bubble. That would be our detection. So there's a <coughs> lot of different detection systems out there, um, anything from visual to radar. And in this case, we are utilizing infrared detection. Um, basically, this detection will detect vehicles, send a control like someone's waiting, and it will give them a green light until they clear, and they'll switch back to the normal phasing. Um, and then coming back is the whole traffic signal management system we have, which is our traffic signal management system. Um, it tells us the current status, the coordination of, this, of the city. So as you go through the corridor, what's green, what's red, calls for service, um, as well as remote management. So I can view uh, traffic signals from here, from across the state, from my office, and out in the field. Um, our Travis Signal Techs also use this system, so they're able to monitor everything in the field or also if they're in a bucket, so they don't have to go back down and see how adjustments are made without wasting time. And now, why are we talking about signals? Um, so I'm coming about two years of being in this position, and I've heard from residents, commuters, TAB members, city council, as well as fellow staff members about what's going on with traffic in Longmont. It's crazy. Um, they might experience inconsistent cycles, such as um, I was waiting for a light, skip me, never got the green, had to wait a whole another cycle or even two cycles to get green. Um, it turned green for two seconds and then let it go, let two cars through, and there's a queue of 20. Um, I waited for 20 minutes for a green, I never got it. As well as pedestrian um, safety measures as well. Um, too short to cross the road, I don't have time to cross. Um, as well as I press the button, never got a call. Um, and then we'll be brushing up on our citizen maintenance and response to changes as well, but you probably don't care much of that as uh, safety measures. So our current network we have right now is called Rhythm in Sync. Um, this system was installed in 2017, and this system was installed in the corridors of Main Street or US 287, Cranberry Pratt Boulevard or State Highway 118, Hover Street, and Nelson Road. Um, since we have this equipment in here, it's been around seven years. The equipment life for this system is five to seven years. It's very typical of any equipment that's out in the field. It deteriorates, it gets hot, it gets cold, it goes out. And that's part of that maintenance piece I talked about earlier. Um, after evaluating the system, we had some faults that were identified and it started becoming more of a snowball effect of what we're dealing with as our traffic system um, deteriorated. Um, got more equipment failures, 
unpredictable behavior when things did fail. So red light, green, flashing lights, you, it was, you couldn't tell a rhyme or reason, which made diagnosing hard. Uh, short cycles, skip, skip calls, and the, the hardest part of the system is access. So this system does not allow city staff to make changes to the timing or evaluate what the system is doing in real time. It goes basically to a black box. We don't know what it's doing until it shows us in real time um, how it's maintaining traffic. Um, Nothing with control is we can't adjust timing plans without contacting the outside support. So if you feel like the light's too short, we need more time on the left-hand turn, uh, pedestrian retimings, we have to go through a separate service to get that done, and that ends up being very costly. Um, the cost for each signal for a new build um, is about $20,000 additional cost to a normal build, plus uh, the support is usually about $250 an hour uh, per signal, so per issue. So if there's multiple si issues we have, we're spending lots of money for someone to fix our own system where we could have city staff more efficiently and put more care into maintaining and fixing the system. So the new system we're switching to is called Centrax Adaptive. Um, the city standard right now is to use Econolite equipment into, in our traffic cabinets. Part of Econolite's range of offerings is the Centrax management software which is basically our uh, monitoring software that lets us see all the signals in real time, coordination, and be able to see the status of each signal, um, whatever may be the issue. Um, that support is included within the licensing agreement that doesn't cost additional per signal. It's a single fee, yearly subscription fee, that is uh, way more acceptable in terms of cost. Um, the biggest benefit, there is no additional equipment needed for this system. So as we get new signals, signals get taken out, or equipment goes bad, there is not additional equipment that's needed that can and will go wrong. So that simplifies our replacement, response times, and also diagnosis. Um, opposed to rhythm, it gives us the exact, um, exact data that is happening at the signal. So how long the signal's green? How, how many vehicles are detected? How long did that signal last? If we ask for reports, we can give you the exact time and how long that light was green for. Along with this, it comes with a new adaptive system, which can adapt in real time by adjusting the cycle times and as well as the um, offsets, which basically there's a master clock and do I give the signal five more seconds in front of this signal and how long does it get to point A to point B? Um, this can be adapted uh, in very short intervals. So it can adapt to weather, ma major events like uh, accidents, as well as everyone's favorite summertime hobby, construction. So signal coordination, I'll go through this one a little fast. Um, basically, we have each signal talk to each other and tell you, I'm turning green now. Um, in 10 seconds, you need to turn green so you let this platoon of vehicles go. Um, platoon of vehicles is just a section of vehicles that are grouped together so we can push through. Let's see if this works. So here we got a little infographic. You can see the light's about to turn green. This platoon of vehicles goes, and it's able to get that platoon through the intersection without turning red. Basically, that's what that entire system does, is it keeps those vehicles going straight through without stopping. Um, we try our best to coordinate. There are some things that come into play when we're trying to get vehicles through as much as possible. Um, but with help of the adaptive system, that allows us, instead of micromanaging each signal per, by one person, we can have the system um, continually update and be able to look at the system as a corridor and not per intersection. Um, some other signal coordination options are free, which is basically first come, first serve. So you'll notice late at night where you just pull up to a signal, it just gives you the green right away, then you go, then it switches back. That's basically free mode. There's no coordination involved. Um, and another section of signal coordination is preemption. Basically, it's called saying um, switch this to green. EMS, PD, as well as trains use this system to uh, respond to calls faster or um, in the event of trains delay traffic even further. Um, in the future, we're looking at buses for bus rapid transit, where buses can be equipped with this technology, where we can have buses go through intersections and corridors faster um, based on what time they arrive at the signal. So uh, we're talking about our new detection system, which is called the FLIR AI traffic cameras. Um, benefit of infrared technology 
is that it removes a lots of issues that normal optical cameras will have. You'll notice sometimes you, um, you might not get green because of sun glare. Um, nighttime objects will not be detected normally. Uh, headlights can cause issues as well as light objects such as motorcycles won't be detected for underground loops. Um, the system also eliminates a lot of issues when it comes to fog or uh, weather events where uh, compared to other systems, it will maintain detection way longer than um, optical detection over snowstorms. Um, another benefit is this new system gives us the ability to detect pedestrians and vehicles and bicyclists separately. Um, so before it was just a single zone. It doesn't, you can't detect whether it's a vehicle, pedestrian, or a bicyclist waiting for um, service. This system will uh, detect and classify individual objects. Now, basically, you can't go with that. So here's the fun stuff. Um, so part of this is called smart tracking. It's part of the AI part of the camera. So it can detect individual objects as well as trajectories and then be able to assume which zones is going to light up sooner. So then it can give that service a lot more efficiency. So watch the video. Um, this is at 11th and Main. Um, as you can see uh, in the boxes, it's like individual objects with a car. And then you'll see some vans on top area. Um, as it can classify better um, vehicles, it will change it to a car or a van. Um, as well as you see the person walking, that's part of that uh, person detection where we can see where the person's walking, what trajectory they're taking, and be able to assume some detection plans. So if we know they're coming to a crosswalk, um, it can make some assumptions of where a person's cro inside the crosswalk and may need more time to cross. Um, part of the detection, you'll see two separate areas. So the left side, this is at 3rd and Main. Um, one side is, has the car tracking with speeds, and the right side has what we have some zones uh, drawn out with what the uh, vehicles are picked up and calls for service. Um, there's many zones. Um, not all of them light up for a reason. Um, basically, we have different setups for different scenarios. So if you don't see them light up, it's not because they're not working. It's just there's certain uh, criteria has to meet before it lit, gets lit up. Um, so you see on the left hand, the, the left picture, you see a motorcycle pulling up. Um, it's able to classify that as a motorcycle. Um, and be able to see where it stops, how fast it's going, and where it's waiting. Um, and you see on the right side is another motorcycle. Um, that's life detection zone, which means it's presence. It'll give it green. Um, and then as cars go through, it starts tracking the speed. And in the background, that little tracker is still running, so it has the direction, and so it knows those people are turning left. Um, as the green is given, these people start accelerating here soon. There we go. Um, and as they're passing through there on the reverse side, you'll see car, motorcycle, motorcycle, and what speed they're going at. So all this information gets transmitted back to us so we can get all that lane by lane counts, speed, direction, um, and be able to provide some really good analytics for safety improvements. Um, this would be someone's favorite, bicycle detection. Um, this is the same time frame, but we have, um, if you look at the top, the left picture on the left-hand side, you'll see a couple uh, people riding bicycles across the intersection, and it's able to identify that it's two separate bicyclists and what direction they're going. So we would be able to um, customize traffic signal phasing in the future for um, bicycle traffic, pedestrian traffic, as well as car, vehicle, um, large trucks, um, anything you think of, we can customize it and be able to implement uh, more efficient traffic flows. And then that brings us to data logging. Um, so basically this, con this system will log every tenth of a second of what's happening at traffic signal. That's everything from when it's green, when it's red, yellow, what vehicles are detected, when it detects it, it will collect that information and send it back to us so that if we need to pull data, we have that information. Um, you'll see on the, the bottom left graphic, um, this is at 3rd and Main um, for the westbound direction. And basically at the we'll go top to bottom. So the top blue line, that's me volume. That's counting how many cars go through that intersection within that time period. The next one is the red, solid red line. That's the time the signal was red. So we can see if you have a complaint about this light has been red for too long, we can see how long the light was actually red. Uh, the light below that is yellow. We can see how long it was yellow and how long that yellow light was on. 
Uh, so if there's any indiscrepancies, we can actually identify those right away and get that issue resolved. Um, below that is green, so we can see what, how are the green times and how many are allotted throughout the day. So if we see that a signal is um, cutting green times at the max and we need to extend those green times, we can see that, but in this case, you can see that there's kind of dips and waves. So you can see that signal is not maxing out its time. Um, so we know that there's not an overload of service there. And it's hard to see on this, you might be able to see on your packet, um, but below has a bunch of little black dots. Those are vehicle detections. So every time a vehicle is detected, it'll show up in that little dot. So if I did a complaint that you know, I wasn't detected, I can see if a vehicle was detected, how long they had to wait, and when it turned green. Um, in addition, this also brings information with pedestrian detection. So in the previous one, we don't know if a pedestrian pushed a button or not. Now we do. Um, you'll see on the right-hand graphic, um, little triangles. So uh, this is the same area. So the ones on the top are ones for the um, westbound uh, pedestrians. So that would be the um, north crosswalk. And it'll tell you how long that pedestrian had to cross. I got a question. Yep. Sorry. You're, you're saying now you know when ped calls are made? You didn't know that before? Um, that old system did not retrieve information for us. Really? Really. Okay. Hence the change. Um, so now when we have a pedestrian-involved incident, we know if they press the button for sure. Um, and the ones on the bottom that show no time, those are for reverse calls of service. So it's not part of that phase, but lets us know that there is someone on the south side. So if I reverse, if I change that screen to show the south crosswalk, it would reverse the sides. So it's not showing us there is zero time. Um, in addition, I know everyone loves waiting for trains in Longmont. It happens about 20 times a day. Not that much, but um, with this new system, we can actually now log and record how long each uh, request for service was between uh, railroad, PD, and any other EMS requests. Um, so you'll see on the, the right side um, a couple examples of our initial system. Um, it'll tell us total amount of pre time, the average pre time, and how many total requests were um, throughout that one day or any specific time period. In addition, it'll tell us exactly what time it turned on and how long it was on. So we can definitely, uh, you know, for information on trains or if it happened just to be a, um, you know, police response for service. And even further, with just the traffic data I was talking about, we collect even further information on travel time. Um, so with this camera system comes. Uh, integrated with a system called Acyclica, which is another service that at no cost. It's included in the system. Um, basically, it uses Wi-Fi to detect travel times and, uh, and the routes that were taken. Um, basically, it takes any Wi-Fi device you have, phone, um, iPod, um, even Wi-Fi in cars, and is able to assign a unique identifier to that um, and be able to track where it goes through intersections. As soon as you're in the system, it doesn't it just counts as a fallen off point. It does not collect any personal data. Um, it works through MAC addresses. So anytime your device is looking for a Wi-Fi network, it's reaching out with its MAC address and saying, hey, on this device, can you read me? That system takes that number, it will give its own unique code, and then it will uh, purge it when it leaves the system. Um, so there's no data collection. We can't see what device it was or how long it was there. Um, it's completely anonymized. Um, this information gives us a ton of data analytics when it comes to travel. Um, so it'll give us, uh, in addition to what the previous system does, it gives us more redundancy as well. It gives us vehicle counts, per lane counts, as well as classifications, delays, vehicle miles traveled, um, origin destination, which is basically saying I started, let's say, at Hover 119, what percentage of cars went north? What percentage of cars went east? What percentage of cars went to 119, 119 and Main Street and then went to Pike? Um, we'll be able to see that information and see how people move throughout the city, um, as well as congestion metrics, which also includes CO2 emissions and as well as idling emissions. So when we're making changes, we can see the environmental impact um, these changes have either improving or degrading as we uh, change timings during our Vision Zero process. Um, 
You'll see on the bottom left is our travel time. Um, this is Main Street um, from Pike to um, US 66. Um, you see that changes throughout the day, but that information is being collected on a 24 hour basis. And we're able to see those travel times and how it changes week to week, day to day, hour to hour. Um, it goes up to a five minute resolution. So we can see definitely um, how people move out throughout the day. I know there's a lot of information. Are there any questions? I got a lot. <sighs> How many of the um, corridors in the city are coordinated? Um, based on time of day. Um, so Which ones? Uh, US 287, Main slash Main Street, State Highway 119, and Ke slash Kempat Boulevard, Hover Street, and let's see, Pike, 3rd, 9th, 17th, Pace, and Francis. I think that's it. Those are all the coordinated ones? Yes. Okay. Are you running adaptive on those as well, or just adaptive on 287, Ken Pratt, Hover, and um, the uh, Nelson? And Nelson? Uh, just those ones. Okay. And Nelson wasn't completely adaptive. I think it was just the bookended of the signals on either side. Is um, that correct? All but one. So 75th Avenue and Nelson, Grandview Meadows, Disc, and then um, Hover and Nelson. Okay. Um, how does adaptive help? with other modes other than automobiles? So that's a big change from this current system to a new system. The old rhythm system, it was designed to move cars along the mainline traffic. So um, a great example is uh, 3rd and uh, 119. Um, big, busy intersection, a lot of people turning left. What would happen is if a pedestrian came to that intersection, press the button, it the system basically says, I want to make 119 move as fast as possible. And how it does that is I'm going to take that left turn time from the cars that are, have been waiting, give that to the pedestrian so that I can get back to the mainline traffic. The issue what happens is it doesn't give pedestrians enough time to cross. It's a big intersection. But also it increases it decreases compliance of the signal. So people, if they get short cycled, they're more likely to run that signal with the next phase because they've already waited a cycle. How does Centrax do it differently? Sendrex has fixed timing. So there's a minimum, there's a maximum, but also we have control of how that system functions. But fixed timing isn't adaptive. No. So the problem with fixed timing is if you program to fixed timing, if there is no call to service, it will automatically go back. So um, I was just this earlier summer, went to Portland um, for vacation, and they do run fixed timing on their uh, corridors. The issue with that is if there's no for room for service, you're stopping cars inadvertently and that they don't need to stop, or in Portland's case, a lot of bicyclists. So people are stopping for no good reason. That's why um, we have the called actuated, where if it sees someone, it will change it. If not, it will keep to the main phase or the main corridor um, to just to decrease the stoppages. So I'll go back to my original question. How does the Centrix adaptive system help other modes other than cars? So we can set up the system to basically move each individual mode separately, but also together. So this old system was made for cars to make cars move faster. This new system with a new detection lets us uh, customize that functionality from signal to signal and from corridor to corridor. So a good example is our main street right now in our downtown. Um, we have implemented, implemented leading pedestrian intervals um, so previous system, you couldn't do that. New system, you can. And basically, um, like fourth main is a good example. You press the button, it will hold traffic all red. Uh, I believe it's for six seconds. So it gets most people mostly across the road and makes it more visible of who's out in the road. Um, we've done this also at our major intersections to decrease the, the visual clutter at the intersections so you know that somebody is not in a car and is somewhere else in the road. So it really differentiates that um, mode of transportation and makes people more aware, hopefully more aware of their presence. So the Centrax adaptive system <coughs> is actually changing the timing of your pet phases? For the most part, it keeps the min and max times, but what it does is it alters the, um, the offsets and then the, um, whether it adds or subtracts time from the off cycles. 
So it, it can get things back in track a bit faster than a uh, non-adaptive system. So you're saying the Centrix adaptive system is mm-hmm. adding time to PED phases when it needs to? Yes. Okay. Um, as well as for cyclists? Yes. Because LPI is not a part of adaptive. LPI is a different, really, concept, correct? Um, this system lets us integrate the LPIs into the adaptive system now. Okay. Um, I noticed the PTZ cameras at intersections. Are they at intersections or at the schools where there are the pickup and the drop-off zones? Because I believe the mm-hmm. school drop-off and pickup zones are separate from intersections. Yep. So the PTCs are separate. Um, we have a few in select location, I think 13, I believe. Um, but there have been placed in previous areas where we um, have seen reason to observe traffic. Or if you go onto uh, the website, we do have a snow cam options for people to view those in, uh, live streams to see roadway conditions. Um, I would damn a slide for this, but um, we do have a new update on another grant um, that we applied for last year. Uh, under the Safe Routes to School grant. Um, basically, we were awarded uh, $1.25 million for 23 intersection upgrades with this detection, which also includes PTZ cameras. So that's my question. Mm-hmm. PTZ cameras aren't at intersections. You said they're at drop-off and pickup zones. Is that correct? Where are they at? Uh, they're at intersections. Okay, so they're not at pickup and drop off times or zones? Uh, we do not have cameras on um, school facilities. Okay. If that makes sense. Right. So, how do the PTZ cameras help city staff better evaluate areas during school drop off and pickup times? Um, so, part of that grant is to install and select areas where we have the existing infrastructure, such as traffic signals, where we can feed that back, those lines back to um, our servers. And part of that is to better observe traffic on a more daily basis versus having to physically go out there and observe traffic with the city staff. Um, allows us to uh, view speed up footage so we can um, value more days a lot more efficiently. So you have PTZ cameras and detection, the FLIR detection, the infrared? Yes. Okay. So no thought about doing a bell shape like a myovision that would do both PTZ and detection? Uh, we have explored those options. Um, a Big um, deal breaker would be um, they require extra equipment into the cabinet, and also that takes that it also runs our controllers a bit more than I'd like to. Um, the FLIR system acts more as a act, vehicle actuator, um, and it, it leaves the controller doing most of the work. Okay, um, I've got a lot here. So. Um, What technology was being used before? Because you're saying that this is new technology to procure this. You didn't have detection at these 23 intersections prior? No, we did. Um, A big issue with how this rhythm system was implemented um, was rhythm requires that their own source code be put onto the cameras. And so we did utilize infrared detection before. um, But the way they did it was they basically flashed old cameras and put their own user interface on there. Um, so you lost all functionality of what anything native to that traffic camera, which made it worse. So if you saw a lot of, um, Hover's a great example, a lot of cross traffic goes through there, bigger trucks. It lights up zones on opposite sides. So that's why you might get a green for no one being there. But how does Hover have to do with anything with schools? Like a school mm-hmm. on Clover Basin didn't yep. have rhythm installed there. No. S- so what detection did you have there prior? Uh, currently out there, it's called the tra- uh, it's a FLIR uh, Traffic Sense 2 camera, um, but that camera is basically zone detection. It doesn't have those features where it detects individual objects. And what brings that sis- what this new technology a great improvement is a pedestrian doesn't necessarily have to be in the zone for us to make um, a current you know a um, controller call based on their direction. So are these 23 intersections all near schools? Uh, Yes, routes to schools. Okay. And how many of those had adaptive? Um, The ones there do not have adaptive. So none of them had rhythm associated with them? No. Okay, but you just said that they did prior. So I'm just trying to... Uh, Those are separate. Um, Sorry, sorry for the confusion. Okay. Uh, 
the ones we got upgraded are on top of the ones that we were placing on Rhythm. So these are brand new detection that are bringing those uh, safety features and analytics to our traffic signal system. Okay. Um, let me jump to something else here. Um, you make a, a note in here about predictable vehicle phases. Can you define that? Yeah. Um, so what we, I can go back to that slide you saw, uh, this one. Sure. Maybe. Yeah. Well, no. Um, so the biggest issue with this rhythm system is it doesn't keep the driving experience consistent for drivers. So it may be, oh, I, especially for cross traffic is okay. One cycle, I might get 20 seconds green at let's, let's take ninth and Hover, for example, a very busy intersection. Um, and then the next cycle, I got stopped there, but the next cycle, it was three seconds. So then I get stopped. And then that next cycle, people are more likely to run it because they got short side when they had to wait for a cycle and then they had to, um, you know, gun it to make the light. So everyone behind that line may not adhere to the traffic signal as much as we'd like. And with this, because of how the system works, it doesn't really deduct time that short. It will fulfill that phase based on the queue size. So if there's a longer queue, it will give that more time. And if it needs to readjust time, it will find that whether it's in phases that aren't used or maybe were ended earlier based on this detection. Okay, um, next question is gonna be, the SPM um, is a lot of data. Mm -hmm. Generally speaking, and this is actually coming from Utah and the University of Utah, they said it's really more about vehicle movement than anything else. So my question to you is, how are the data sets that you develop with SPM gonna help with Vision Zero? Yep, so that's the big thing to have that classification, is now we can see um, vehicles, types of vehicles, as well as we are detecting pedestrians within crosswalks and bicycles in lanes and in crosswalks. Um, so we'll see what that use is. So at certain sections where, let's say we may expect uh, a bicyclist to use the existing uh, road that has made as a bike lane, but we see that 50% of peop uh, bicyclists are using the crosswalk by the sidewalk and not the uh, bicycle lanes. That could inform us to maybe make some adjustments to the bicycle lanes, maybe provide some more protections, um, and really, you know, find out why bicyclists, pedestrians, or motorists are doing the things that they're doing. So um, with this ATSPM, um, what are you using as a decision support system? Because really, SPM is just a lot of data. Or yes. What system is really your decision support system for that? Is it all manual? So our, I guess what we do with that data? Mm -hmm. um, so that's going to go right into our Vision Zero action plan, which is, um, great timing on this update plus how we're updating Vision Zero. And when we're talking about the community of what changes you want to see, and there may be areas where um, there may not be a lot of pedestrian activity, or there might be areas where we don't think we see a lot of bicyclists, but it turns out we see a lot of bicyclists. Um, and we're able to see those intersections and those volumes, so we can really focus those projects to prioritize areas that are being um, utilized more, but also in those areas that are high injury uh, network. Okay, um, and then you the the money being spent for near miss and um, event detection at high injury intersections. Do you have already a vendor in place that you're going to be buying? Because it says here for the procurement consultant assisted evaluation, mm -hmm. or are you um, still looking at? I have a second presentation coming up that will explain that. Okay, that's good to know. Um, <clears throat> and then my last question is, let me find it here. Um, have you worked at all with public safety to discuss speed corridors, much like the city of Fort Collins? Yes. Great. Uh, we're in active talks right now, um, and we'll present some more information in the very near future. Okay. All right. Great. That's my questions. Anybody else? On the smart tracking, um, you can see part of the roadway. So you can see um, the, the, the side that the traffic is facing. And you said that it can detect pedestrians. But 
what happens if the pedestrian's on the other side? So um, we have uh, four cameras at each intersection. So this is only one camera in one direction. But if the pedestrian's on the other side of that crosswalk, there's a camera that's going to be able to de uh, detect yeah. that. Yeah, so this pedestrian. is for uh, nor uh, southbound traffic. We also have a camera that's po pointing for eastbound traffic that captures that crosswalk as well. So that blind spot will be captured? Yes. Okay. And then you also detected uh, speed. If you see vehicles um, driving too fast, would the lights be able to synchronize and either present a red light if somebody's going too fast to slow traffic down? Or are you only detecting speed? What are you detecting speed for? So these do not change the signal based on speed, but what we can do is set up detectors based on speed. Um, so as we're going to different sections of the town, we can say, don't turn this detector on unless you're going below 45 miles per hour. So if somebody's going 45 and a 25, yep. you can change a light further down the path? Uh, no. No. Okay. Um, but we can also, if it's already red, we can hold that red until they're going the acceptable speed. Okay. Great. Thanks. Um, and then, let's see. Um, on the... The adaptive networks, what are the green and white dots? If you go slide six. Slide six. Yeah. Um, so that basically it's the status of each um, light. So does this work? No, never mind. Um, so this is actually a picture from uh, earlier this year from our uh, rhythm system. So each white dot is our controller in free, that's what I talked to earlier, that's that first come first serve. But this is what comes with the issue with, ah, that works. Um, this is the issue we had with rhythm, is it basically to make it work, our controllers all have to be in free. And that means that all our signal performance measures are disabled. It does not give us any information that is pretty relevant to what actually is happening to traffic. Um, the green dots are coordinated. Um, so you see these quarter, these quarters are, are uh, coordinated. And then all these rhythm, and this is when we were building the Harvest Moon light. Um, so that's blue because it means it's offline. Um, so the current view I have right now is most of these are green during the day. And then for the new controllers or the, the new system that you're posing, um, is there real-time adjustments or are you only looking at data historical data to make um, changes in the future. Yeah, so great example today. Um, we had a, there was an accident at uh, I-25 and 52. Um, so outside Longmont, so we have no clue what's happening, but all of a sudden we have a influx of people coming on 119 through um, town. Uh, County Line Road 1 was backed up all the way to uh, Fairgrounds, not Fairgrounds, Fairview. Um, and previously we can't adjust those timings from my desk, I can hold those that controller green remotely to let traffic through. And as soon as I get those uh, kind of impulses of people through, I can resume the normal timing. So in events where we get some weird um, influx of people, um, we can make those uh, manual adjustments so that traffic can start flowing normally again. Um, this is also utilized or could be utilized, it wasn't installed yet, uh, during the Lions Fire that happened in beginning of August. Um, where we had evacuations um, from Lyons through uh, Highway 66. Um, in that case, we can make faster adjustments to let more people through and hold um, hover traffic so we can get people evacuated faster. And then is there staff that's uh, on call for this? Because what happens if it's during non-business hours? Yep. So we have traffic signal technicians who are on call. Um, they take shifts of who's on call, who's not. And then if any other uh, assistance is needed, I'm uh, always available. So my phone's never off. Okay. That's all I had. Thank you. That's how it's you. Uh, thank you. Hi, Kyle. Uh, good job presenting. Lots of information. Yep. Yep. Sorry, it was too much information <laughs> at once. No, no. It was a lot. Um, my question's about rhythm. And mm -hmm. um, where's the historic data going? Like, is it ours? Is it the city's? Are we going to able? Are we going to be able to extrapolate or compare it to our new systems data? Yep. 
Um, so we've actually been utilizing Celica for a little bit now in separate units. Mm -hmm. um, that was installed previously by um, previous engineers. Mm -hmm. um, so we're actually able to save a lot of that travel time data um, and then have it directly integrate into our new data. But since we have more intersections um, loaded, mm -hmm. we can actually get higher resolution and see w what the speeds, volumes um, are from, from uh, intersection to intersection. And this is all happened now. No one, it, rhythm's no longer happening. Um, we have about two thirds of the city converted right now. Right now, we don't have Hover okay. um, from basically Pike to Highway 66. Mm -hmm. um, we've been utilizing operational dollars to mm -hmm. fund this project. Um, so this has not been an additional ask from um, the, for the city. Mm -hmm. And then Hover's planned to be upgraded at the beginning of the fiscal year. Oh, okay. That was my follow-up question. Like, yep. when do you think it'll be all done? Cool. And you said it's like no new equipment, right? Um, so we're buying uh, new uh, cameras and mm -hmm. then upgrading our new controller slash upgrade or buying new ones. Mm -hmm. um, but the software and the adaptive portions of it require no additional equipment. So we're not incurring any extra costs when we're installing new traffic signals. Cool. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Kyle. That was a very informative presentation. Um, just one thing, for my dictionary of acronyms, what is a PTZ camera? Pan, tilt, zoom. Pan, tilt, zoom. So move in all directions. And then. Thank you. Yep. Hi, um, just a few questions. Thank you for the presentation. Um, what is the price difference between the two different systems? So, man, I got rid of that slide. Um, so basically a big decision maker for this system was it was failing and presumably the entire system for rhythm would have to be replaced within the next couple of years. Um, based on the costs and support um, that required to get that up operational, we were looking at, I think, close to three and a half to four million dollars for the system. Um, to upgrade the system, get brand new detection, and to be on adaptive is about a $2 million project, but that secures all our licensing agreements for five years. So there's no additional cost for five years to run this, um, the new system. After that, it's a fraction of the cost. Uh, I believe it runs about $20,000 a year for the software agreement versus Rhythm was $1,500 per intersection per year. So before we had about 57 of them, times that by 1,500, I mean, we're looking about, I think, $75,000 a year to use the system versus 20. Um, that does not include hardware costs, which for a new signal, um, just for the Centrax stuff, it would be about uh, $4,500 for a new signal. Uh, to install the rhythm equipment would be about 16 grand. And that's also in the same event if a uh, signal cabinet gets run over by a car. Okay, thank you for those yep. numbers. Um, it seems like those seem like pretty big numbers to me. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm just wondering, um, I know it's probably no surprise, but um, have you taken into account those types of figures of like the long-term running costs of um, traffic signals versus just converting them to a roundabout? Yeah, so um, this project, so $2 million, is upgrading um, 55 current signals. We're leaving two on Nelson Road um, based on operating dollars. Um, we'll probably get those done with Hover at uh, the beginning of the year. Um, but we're looking at $2 million. That may cover a small roundabout in a very um, undeveloped area of town um, versus this one covers major corridors within the city and provides lots of improvements for many vehicles and many pedestrians and many bicyclists throughout the city. Okay. So it's still cheaper, even when you take into account the, the long-term running costs. Yep. And this project basically started about a year ago and we're almost done versus any roundabout. We'd be still in the design phase for any roundabout. Okay. And what about the maintenance for those? The maintenance is another plus is with the uh, rhythm system. We had about 
seven pieces of equipment just for the rhythm system, plus four camera detectors with the Centrax system, there's no additional equipment that we wouldn't already have in the controller or in the cabinet. And what are the general costs for those, that maintenance? Um, like I said, over the, um, the equipment on those is about every five years. So we're looking basically that plus the cameras, um, 20, probably about $45,000 per intersection. Every five years. Uh, every five years. Yes. Okay. Based on the rhythm system. Um, in my experience with the Centrax system, we've had controllers that have been out there for 10 to 15 years and they've been functioning perfect. Um, another benefit is instead of replacing, um, like Chairman Laner alluded to is, uh, they have detection cameras that can do an entire intersection. Um, those prices are comparable to doing the separate FLIR AI detection. The benefit we have is if that one camera goes bad, we replace one camera, not all four. If a camera goes bad in, um, you might see technology like grid smart, myovision, if their camera goes bad, we have to replace that entire system. And so that cost just rises up for maintenance. Okay. It just seems like there's, there is a lot of ongoing costs. Like it's not a free thing. Yep. Like, yeah. And uh, one benefit of this project was it was based on um, existing dollars. Um, so we're not, you know, incurring more um, m money requests from the general fund to fund this project. Okay. I always like to bring up roundabouts every time. Just yep. Yep. Because. They are the safest thing to have. Um, so you talked about, I'm just going to um, switch topic a little bit. Um, for the signal coordination uh, between different intersections, that's just for cars, right? It doesn't take into, into account like a slower moving vehicle like a bike. Um, that'd be correct. Um, the hardest thing about bikes is speeds can vary greatly for bicyclists. Um, so how a lot of the initial timings are set is based on vehicle average running speed. Um, so we know from point A to point B, how long it would take a vehicle to start up, go get up to speed. And then by the time they get to the light, what point that needs to turn green to have them move through the intersection. The hardest thing about bikes is it could be someone who's very, you know, big biker, it can go 15, 20 miles per hour. Or it might be someone taking a leisurely stroll going, you know, 10 miles per hour. It's very hard to predict if they're, when they're coming through that intersection. Um, we, we talked about Vision Zero. There is possibilities when we're looking at uh, coordination timing to um, add in bicycle um, facilities based on maybe if we dedicate corridors. But that'll be based on uh, Cami's Vision Zero plan. Okay. So I have experienced this many a time where I go from intersection and I stop. And then the next intersection, I have to stop. It, it's pretty annoying as a, mm -hmm. a cyclist that you go from, you're so stopping. It isn't really for cyclists. No, it's not for cyclists. So it's not mm -hmm. really multimodal. Really. Yeah. And when we have a uh, Kaufman um, busway startup, um, there may be some options to maybe focus that more on because we know buses and uh, multimodal users are going to be the majority of the users of that road. And it's not really designed to be a car road. Um, we can have further discussions about how we want that corridor to function for um, bicyclist travel. Okay. Um, so it's, it's, you're detecting by IR, right? Yep. Um, is there a maximum temperature for that IR detection? Uh, I believe it's negative 30 to 140 degrees. Okay. Fahrenheit. <sighs> I work in Celsius, so that's... that's <laughs> <laughs> uh, Maybe Native like, 60 to... Like 45? I'm just... 75? 75. 75, that sounds yeah. really hot. Well, 140 is pretty hot. Yeah. That sounds about right. Is that right? I have no idea. I didn't wake up at <laughs> Very cold to very hot. <laughs> okay. I was just wondering, like, in... The only reason why I'm asking is we're, we're going to be having a, a warming um, heat mapping system. You know, the, with the heat maps um, in Normon, some areas are pretty hot especially mm -hmm. during the day like the time i can get really hot so i was just wondering like is there a point where the ir just no longer works because it just gets so hot um you can actually calibrate it uh based on what you want to detect so we do have some areas that do get pretty warm uh good example i can think of right now is at third and pace there's a great fence that kind of goes into our detection view and when it gets really hot that fence heats up really good um we're actually able to it's called masking so it's basically 
I just tell the camera, hey, you see this area? Ignore it. And just focus on the, the road. Um, and so it detects whether there's a vehicle. So the nice thing about vehicles is um, anything from the engine to the wheels uh, to the windshield, that's generally cooler if you're running the AC, it can detect those a lot easier because of the temperature difference. Okay. Um, so have, is there data out that tells you that it's actually safer for to have the um, pedestrian light go first and then it the light changes for the traffic? Like, is there actual data that says that, that actually is a safer method? Uh, yes, I can't quote exact numbers off the top of my head, uh, but I know uh, NACTO is a lot of federal um, funded studies that do say leaning in real times do increase safety. Okay, because it's actually decreased my safety, I would have to say. I get run over way more now than I was before. Hmm. Like, cars will, because they wait, and then they're just getting annoyed because they can see that all well, the lights are red, and then they just try and gun it around when they have a left turn. Yeah, and we're, we're, we're some new standards for Vision Zero, but the goal is to have motorists wait and be like, oh, why is it still red? Look around and be like, oh, someone's crossing, because normally they would have to yield anyway to pedestrian crossing if it turned green right away. So they're not saving any time if it's red. But it gives them a moment of pause of something different's happening, so you should be observant around your surroundings versus I'm just waiting for the green to go. Okay. I'm just following on from that. Um, <laughs> since you can, can detect pedestrians and bicyclists in that intersection and you can control when the lights turn, mm -hmm. Can you just make it so that those pedestrians and cyclists can just get across the entire intersection before you change the lights? Um, with this new system, that's part of that new standards and gaining more community feedback of how things should function. Um, and then also with the data we're receiving, we can see how loaded the intersection is and be able to make those adjustments. Okay. So, so I'd, say, uh, I'd say yes, there is a great possibility. So, like, if some if it was a pedestrian who needed lots of extra time to cross, mm -hmm. and the lights traditionally just go way too fast for them, mm -hmm. and it would stop the lights turning at all. Yep. So the goal would be to hold all red until the intersection is clear. Okay. Because that would, in theory, make it safer. Yes. In theory. Um, and would that be for left turning and right turning, or just left? Um, so that'd be based on uh, pedestrian pre presence. Um, so it would, be, it would be based on the car detection. It'd be based on pedestrian detection. But I mean, for cars turning right, would it stop them too? Yeah, it would. It would hold red. But cars can turn right on a red. Uh, currently, yes. But through Vision Zero, that's a fun thing. We're going to evaluate our standards. So it doesn't. It only stops the ones turning left, really. Um, right now. Well, technically, at a red light, even if it's uh, right turn on red, they still have to yield to oncoming traffic, which a pedestrian would be considered oncoming traffic. Uh, um, but maybe. through Vision Zero, we're looking at <laughs> having some more um, options in our toolbox um, and be able to have more of a clear flow of what is put at intersection and why it is. So um, Vision Zero is part of that plan to make a standard and make that more of a force instead of... I'll just put it here, put it here, put it here, put it here. Okay. Because it, I, I think that just delaying it is just kind of just delaying a possible mm. collision. I don't know that it's, I mean, maybe it does help a little bit, but ultimately, you should watch, still your having watch my next presentation. Okay. Um, and you've already answered my last question. What was that other question? I'll ask again. I okay. got two of them more. So okay. You're good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Kyle. Yep, no problem. See. Well, <clears throat> I guess it's my turn. Um, you know, it, it's pretty simple. I, I think a follow-up on the roundabout. Um, you know, I, I understand. You know, it's more cost to actually build the roundabout and destroy an intersection. Mm -hmm. But let's say we did have a city of a few actually modern roundabouts. Wouldn't you argue then it would be cheaper to then maintain over the lifetime? of that existing compared to every five to seven years the technology mm. has to be upgraded yes so that's one benefit about is that less maintenance yeah um one thing that we run into a lot of the corridors we're talking about tonight is we don't actually own the roadway right <laughs> so making those changes is very hard mm -hmm. um the areas we don't 
Um, I would say during Vision Zero, that's a discussion we can have and have a more community force to having roundabouts. I am an advocate of roundabouts. We are pushing for roundabouts in several areas of our development review discussions. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I would love to see more roundabouts in Longmont. Okay. I, I just wanted to clarify that that point. And then, um, and then also just from the video we saw of the pedestrian, you know, person walking, um, obviously we can't predict what they're doing if they're going to mm -hmm. take a right, uh, stay on the sidewalk, or they want to cross the road. So they are essentially forced to always press the beg button. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, be, because I know, you know, it, it gets, you know, I, I, I just see, like, it, like it's hard in like the downtown area where we used to not have to press. And I've been hearing a lot of complaints uh, around that of, mm -hmm. as I like, go oh, now, there's an extra step involved. Yeah, and uh, we can talk about uh, be more standardization of Vision Zero. Um, okay. But my philosophy right now would be it makes pedestrians more predictable. Yeah. Because uh, a lot of times you see a person, they'll just kind of walk across the road and then all of a sudden just veer. Yeah. And for a motorist, that's very unfair on them because they, they believe it's clear. They're being, they're being diligent. They think mm -hmm. the intersection is clear, but all of a sudden someone just 90 degree turns out in traffic. That's a very hard thing to predict. Um, by pressing the button... Right, you're, it you're lets saying, you know. It, it shows your intention to cross. Yeah, it's same thing like using your turn signal as you're turning. Yeah, yep. Uh, sometimes that works. So sometimes. sometimes people leave them on. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yep. Train right to the world. Yeah. Um, no, I, I think that's it for me. I, I do know there was a complaint along Bic, but I think I've seen it kind of change of the the lpis in downtown and and it was very short uh mm -hmm. on and then it went to the countdown it was on for like a second and i think that's yeah, improved. there, there are uh, some it's a brand new uh, yeah. program for yeah. the controllers that we're learning so yeah we figured out what issue it was we got it fixed now okay cool and uh, that's it for me all right um so i was wondering with the um with the AI traffic detection, um, is this uh, are these cameras also used to investigate crashes or criminal activity? Uh, no, and I hold that question for the next presentation. Okay, sounds good. And uh, will your presentation have any? Um, I know that in twenty twenty two there was also sound cameras that were installed. I was wondering what came of those, or if that's your department. Uh, that would be uh, PD. Okay. Um, I wasn't around when they were integrating those. I don't know if uh, Jim or Phil have any information on the sound cameras, but um, last thing I knew is they didn't produce the results um, that were needed for adequate enforcement. Um, left a lot of gray area that was not enough confirmation to actually, you know, make contact and make a citation. Sounds good. Um, also, for the uh, Acyclica data analytics, um, it says that you could uh, that there's data sharing across municipalities. What municipalities are currently being uh, shared? Yeah. It's like it was like lovely. So yeah, the ones we have currently. Um, yeah. So where's my little pointer? So this is Lama right here, yeah. and. Um, Loveland has had a few of them out. Um, they have the, the separate units, not the detection, um, that just do travel time. And the same thing for Greeley. Um, so we're actually able to see travel time. So right now we can actually see how fast, how long, and how many people go from uh, Campion uh, to 66. Um, so it's great information. You're uh, sharing municipalities. Um, I know Denver is looking into the AI cameras. They have a few. Um, but right now, uh, I believe Lamont's one of the biggest adopters for the new detection cameras. Nice. Uh, great. Well, uh, thanks for your presentation. Yep. I've got a couple follow-ups. Yep. Um, so in regards to the additional funding um, and consultant for evaluation of the existing site distance and recommendations to update city standards, I'm just curious about that because sight distance is sight distance. You're not going to change that in an intersection. So how is that going to change the city standards? So that uh, consultant is going to evaluate at um, several intersections throughout the city, not just signalized. 
Um, so good examples are old town areas that are very dense, very tight. And a common complaint we have is people parking, you know, closer to the intersection and they can't see to make a left or a right. Um, this study is going to look at several intersections and provide recommendations on what the new city standard should be to create that sight distance triangle that's more safe for um, motorists as well as bicyclists and pedestrians so they can see and react to um, oncoming traffic. Uh, right now, our sight distance triangle is a 30 by 30 triangle, mm -hmm. um, which is very tight and it's very hard, especially in our tighter areas. So um, we're looking to create a safe network, but we know why we have the consultant on board is if we do make these changes, it's going to severely impact uh, residential properties, commercial properties. Um, you know, based on safety is why we're pushing it, but we need to acknowledge that it's going to impact a lot of people's lives. But don't narrow sight distances actually make roads safer? Um, not when you're turning and you can't react to a car you can't see. So if, you, if you're... I, I, I could probably pull up off my phone five studies that would show you that sight distance in terms of narrowing road diets mm -hmm. make streets more safe not less safe well the difference is slow down. Um, having clear sight distance that aren't blocked by cars so um, I think a lot of those studies it probably has you know concrete bulb outs and uh, green spaces where you can see over them and see down the street um, a good example, if you guys are leaving tonight, um, you know, the 4th Avenue corridor, especially over by the uh, St. John's School, if you go across there, those cars that parked there during the day, it's very hard to see if someone's coming. And so you have to position yourself either from front or behind the crosswalk to see if there's any cars coming. And best case scenario, you have a little sliver of room to see if a car is coming. Okay. Um, but there's an acceptable amount of distance, uh, room for somebody to make a decision to stop or go. Okay. Um, and I just want to re kind of rebring up. So, so you're saying the new system, because um, board member McKee Burroughs asked as well, that you're actually able to add time to any ped phase that needs to have time added if somebody's walking slowly across. Yeah. So, um, sorry to include a uh, pedestrian crossing the road. When I was recording, I could, no one showed up and I was on a time limit for this one. <laughs> Um, so it's bicycle detection. Can I pause this video? So you see the bikes coming in here. So before they come in, mm -hmm. I know it's kind of white on black, so it's kind of hard to see. Oh, yeah. There's my bookmark. See, so it's kind of hard to see. But as this bicycle comes into this zone right here, it's kind of hard to see, but light, it'll light up and basically say there's a call for service and it can extend that time for someone crossing. So um, this side would be a better view, but basically see this one's black, it'll light up. And if there's a pedestrian or a bicyclist. Is it a preset time? Um, it can be a dynamic. It can be dynamic? Yep. Based on the speed of the object? Um, so technically, yes, it takes some additional programming. Um, but with these type, different types of zones, we can assign different outputs um, and basically say, um, you know, if someone's in the zone, give them this much time. If they're still in the zone, um, add five more seconds and so on and so forth. So can these corridors be timed for all modes of, of transportation? In other words, most adaptive and most coordination is based on vehicles. Mm -hmm. Is there a way to find a happy medium that would also satisfy a cyclist? Vehicles would have to slow down. Mm -hmm. And obviously pedestrians would be probably the one that would maybe be the biggest, I'll call it loser in that equation. <coughs> but would there be a way to uh, coordinate signals to accommodate all modes of traffic? There is a possibility for that. Um, it would just depend on some of the analytics we get back, such as when I allude to bicycle timing and how fast bicyclists are going. We'd have to collect that information and see how fast a bicyclist is going on average to create a close plan. But Isn't your FLIR AI able to do that, though? Tell you? Yes. Okay, so it's going to tell you the objects and their speed? Yes. Okay. Yep. So I'm, I'm not saying completely yes is going to be integrated, but there is availability, and having that information does open up that possibility. And having a data back decision instead of just trying to estimate based on you know three hours of observation. Sure. Now, is that is that 
change or decision going to be made manually and by a human, or is it made by the system or intelligence built into the system? Uh, initially human, and then um, we can have the adaptive system kind of um, take over the day-to-day -day operations. So the adaptive also controls the PED phases? Um, those are set times. So that's a hard block. So it will not override, say, give pedestrian less time. It, will, it, can, on, it can only add to the pedestrian times. Okay, so adaptive can add to the pen phases. Yes, it, it will not subtract, though. Okay, so but it can add. It can add. Okay, all right, great. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yep. Let's see, I think that's everybody. You want to give your update so I can get some water? Sure. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. I just have two questions. Um, they're pretty quick. How does it prioritize buses? Um, so buses have their separate uh, preamp system. Um, so they can have different, there's different options for it. GPS, um, there's little like frequency blasters that are on sales already that can tell that the bus is coming. Um, and so it'll, depending on when it gets there, we can either say hold green or um, give the bus green. But it's something that's on the bus. Yeah, so it's, it's something that the bus has that has to coordinate, that has to transmit data to the controller. And does RTD or Flex already have this equipment? Um, they do in a few areas, but there is an active group um, within uh, Denver, including Longmont, Boulder, um, about introducing um, bus rapid transit, which includes having that preemption, preemption system in place. But if it doesn't faster. include it, would the city have to provide that to RTD or Flex? Um, we work cooperatively. Okay. And then for uh, slide 14, for the, the Wi-Fi enabled devices, yes. is a user opting oh. into this or is it just their SSID that's broadcasting and it's picking up so they're not actually having to opt into something? How, how is it? So the, the nice thing about this versus some other systems is if you want to opt out, the best thing to do is shut off your Wi-Fi. So um, it's not an, an app that so a user has to no, download No, no, you have to anything. download it. We're not force turning on anything. It's because they're transmitting that data freely. Okay. So if they like to opt out, the best thing is to do is shut off your Wi-Fi when you're not using it. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. And that'd be the same with any uh, wireless network of how that works as well. Right. Got about ten minutes. That's fine. I just want some water. This is the part of the program where we say, and now it's time for something completely different. <laughs> but, um, yeah. But Kyle will be back, so um, just a moment while we get the next. We're going to do the uh, flex bus real quick, if that's okay with everybody. And uh, I'll, I'll give you some preamble on that as well. Do you want to go or do you want to? Uh, need a flex bus here, I did here. Air motion. Yeah, so good segue, uh, board member uh, Kalkoffer, it's the uh, bus, it's bus time. So let's talk a little bit about uh, flex and transport, and my apologies, I really did want somebody from transport to be here tonight to, to present to you tonight about this and really give you the expert view. What can happen and what, will, what I do plan to happen is when we start to talk about the contract and the intergovernmental agreement that we do every year with flex, we can have them come up and give you a fuller and more um, detailed presentation, but this is a real quick one. I'm going to read a little bit from their presentation. They're kind enough to give me some information to help share with you what's going on with the with the with the flex. So you know about the flex a little bit. I think we talked. I've heard some people talk about writing it, so that's great. Um, it is a regional partnership. Uh, it really does operate along 287 mostly, and then now 119 down to Boulder. So it operates Monday through Saturday. It's been a free ride since the pandemic. So once the pandemic came, they decided to not worry about fare collection because of the different issues with touching and germs and those kind of things. So they kind of turned it off and now they've approached us and said, well, we can put in, we need to put in all new fare equipment, but it's gonna cost X millions of dollars, right? So we can either just keep it fare free and not 
put that in and not charge ourselves that and not charge you this and keep it free or we can try to put this back in and we've kind of our idea was really we wanted the fares to come back just to give some value to the service because as people are using the service for free um, there has been some abuse on the system i'll be quite frank with you and so there is an idea that if you were to charge you might keep some of that abuse down and so um but at this point we're going to just say it's going to continue as free because it's easier for everyone and it costs less for everyone and it's kind of the right thing to do for uh, people without the means to afford transportation so uh we this used to be called the fox trot route when it ran just from loveland to fort collins then we kind of got our noses into it and uh wanted to wanted them to serve longmont and uh, there was an opportunity there to really get a grant they wanted to get the grant to extend service they thought longmont made the most sense it was really the first time that we saw this other type of public transit in the regional transportation district, which is RTD. So it was a good incursion into that RTD system. So we really appreciated that. Uh, and then when they started additional express service to Boulder in 2016, so they got another grant and we extended that service even further into Boulder. So now you have a CU to CSU connection, which this week really means a lot because the big rivalry is Saturday, the Rocky Mountain Showdown, right? So um, there are three variations to the route. There's the F1, which really does just serve Fort Collins to Loveland, so it's that old fox trout, fox trot route. There's the Fort Collins to Longmont only, which uh, serves, uh, let me just read this. They, um, so the, the fox trot or the, 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 the Loveland and uh, Fort Collins route serves 17 southbound trips and 19 northbound trips per weekday this f2 serves uh basically nine trips in both directions per weekday so that's nine trips going to longmont every day uh, back uh, both directions and then the f3 which is that service to boulder that we talked about that also serves longmont quite frankly and that express runs six trips both south and north um, per weekday so those are the variations of the route what's happened uh and you might kind of expect this is that with the idea that a bolt route between boulder and longmont costs a certain amount of money uh still has a fare charged some folks are using this to get on the uh, you know make that trip but they're not not supposed to technically so rtd kind of has a provision with with this flex bus to not allow riders to get on in Longmont to go to Boulder. And you're not supposed to let people off who get on in Boulder in Longmont, but it's impossible, right? So these things are happening and it's just the way, I mean, it's just, it's just the reality. So uh, everybody kind of looks, looks, right. <laughs> yeah, you can't get off the plane. So um, just to let you know some of those things. And then we have a funding chart that really talks more about how we do the different types of dollars for this. And you'll see how it's broken down, at least in 2022, when this chart was provided to us. Uh, the 2023 stuff wasn't quite complete at the time. There, they had done some original operating costs for 2023, but had not put together the numbers for that yet. And I'll just say that we just paid an invoice for $144,439, which you can see how that compares to 22. So we've gone, got, gone down quite a bit, and that's really because Transport's been really good about getting grants for this for this route, and especially with the IIJ or the IIJA um, grant dollars and all the federal dollars that have come into these systems, they've been able to cut down our costs, which has been great. So we only paid one hundred and forty four four thirty nine just a couple of days ago, right, Jim? Right. <laughs> so, um, and that and that ridership and those numbers are really based on the right. Those numbers of costs, the funding amounts that we provide, are really based on over the years of, of ridership. So you'll see 7.03 shown here. I think it's gone up to 7.28% was, was the more, more latest number that we paid for the 2024 number. So our, our ridership always hovers around that 7 to 8% number, which is, which is good. And that's how we determine the percentage that we pay. So um, let me see. They also say that they have a total of 138,638 riders for the year. 
we'll kind of show a little bit of how that looks on a chart. And these are kind of tough to read, but it's what we have. You'll see that yellow line that dips way down in May of 2020 is our pandemic. And so the ridership went basically down to zero because they stopped service. And then they picked it back up again in June, uh, very moderate service. And you can see that numbers were tough to come back. But then over the years, so the 2019 number is that blue line at the top. And you'll see that gold line then takes off from there and then starts to fall pretty precipitously. So it was going on a fairly typical track of what we were seeing in 2019, in 2020, and then the pandemic. And then those other lines, the green, the blue, the red, and now the purple, all are those different indicators as we get those different years going as far as 2021, 22, 23, and then 24 is the purple. And you can see that we are um, making some adjustments that are getting us back to uh, some of those more 20 or 2019 numbers, which is good to see. But I would want to ask Flex the num what's going on with the 2023 number and the 2024 number there for August. But um, we usually see a spike in ridership with the schools coming back online. So that might be part of it. And we may not have complete numbers from that August piece as well. So it'll be interesting to see kind of how this gets into later months as we go forward. But this does give you an idea. Uh, this is a per month basis. So you see about the highest was about 20,000 per that October of 2019. So we were moving, you know, in, we always like to compare this to car traffic. And so you just saw a bunch of numbers showing car traffic. Of course, we don't know how many times the same car went through that intersection. We, we pretty much know that um, probably the same riders are riding every day. So that's another piece of this is how many new riders versus um, those consistent riders that we get. But you can see that there was constant, there was, there's been pretty good growth over the years. Well, there was pretty good growth up until 2019. And now we're starting to build it back. Well, we'd have to get transport in here and really ask those, them those questions because that would have to be based on survey data. With the fare structure, you can, you know, if you have the fare on your phone and you've given some information about who you are as a writer, we can get some of that information, maybe from RTD, those those type of things. But I'm not sure with nobody showing any kind of fare and people just walking on, you'd almost have to survey each or make observations of each individual. And that won't tell you anything about economics or anything either. So. You really need to ask the questions, and I don't know if they've done that. So, right, yeah, and we've seen some very significant changes in that with transit. So you're right; that's a great question to ask, and we'll make sure they come back with that one. Well, and um, you know, we'll we can find that information out as well, and I can ask that demographic question easily, and we can get that to you in email. If, if they have it. The next piece is really those future goals for transport, and this is the part where I really wish they were here to talk more about this, but um, they do talk about the transport transit master plan, so how their future looks. That demand for regional services, is it growing? That kind of gets back to some of your demographic questions, and maybe they're running at the wrong times if it's talking about commuter trips versus those maybe more of those weekend trips because that's when the students are traveling more is the weekends. And they're always always trying to grow our partnerships, and that's been great. So we have all a number of different communities that are working together. You saw the list of Loveland, Berthoud, Longmont, Boulder, Larimer County, Boulder County, Fort Collins. They do want to add some new services. We do want them to grow their services, so we're asking them to increase it so that there's more ridership. But when we talk about the micro microtransit service piece of this and talk about getting service out to that mobility hub, we're trying to get Longmont residents out to a, a different Mustang type service that's already running on that corridor and connecting Fort Collins with Denver with us. And so there's other issues there too. And I think the Flex is trying to be very cognizant of the different markets that are being served. So that is maybe more of a commuter shed on I-25 and this could be more of a, maybe that weekend piece and, and off peak times that aren't really commuter. 
And then um, I'm not sure what the increased sustainability means, if that's sustainability of the network or if that's sustainability for more environment, more environmental pieces. But um, I'll check my notes here and just try to see that they are trying to Transport also has a goal of converting their bus fleet to battery electric by 2040 in accordance with the Fort Collins City Sustainability Program. So as of fall of 2024, Transport operates five electric buses on their local routes and is working on the additional more of these buses and the, inf and the infrastructure to support them. They also talk about running on um, compressed natural gas. We don't know if that's renewable or not, or um, but we do have that capability in, in the city of Longmont with our trash trucks, so we are always trying to sell that service because we always have an, an excess or a surplus of that. So we're always trying to talk these bus companies into maybe um, going to our RNG type service, renewable natural gas, rather than just a compressed. And then, of course, for more info, visit their pages at uh, ridetransport.com. And they have some pretty good um, schedules out there if you do have interest in going up to Fort Collins or down to Boulder, we say that on the side. Um, go ahead and check their schedules and see. We have a couple of stops in Longmont, so we do have the, with what is now the Bross and 8th, Bross and Longs Peak stop, where we moved all the buses over there. They also have stops along, um, it was hard to tell from that map, but they have a stop along 9th. When they're going to Boulder, they don't come into the Bross Street station, they keep going uh, west out to Hover, and they go down that way. We they like that service because that doesn't cross any railroad tracks like like RTD does have to. So there are some options out there for how to get around with using the service. And if you check those schedules, you'll see more. So thank you from Transport. <laughs> I'll be their spokesperson for now. Any questions? Any more questions? Um, I, I'm going to guess you probably don't know, but you know what... <laughs> It, what what times they're planning on increasing their services to? Because I I mean I used to take it every day as my as a commuter, and there was three buses one way and three buses the other way, and that was it. And it's pretty limiting unless you're going in those particular times. So it sounds like they're planning on having more times of their buses, but I was just wondering if you knew. My understanding is that they are looking at the who's using the buses now and those demands that they get from folks just calling in. It used to be that there was they were trying to interline with the RTD bus system, so they could get to Boulder on the Bolt and make that connection. But without you know with the direct service now, that's not as necessary. They'd also make it was also a really great place in Longmont to make a connection between Fort Collins and Denver before the bus staying, or with if you wanted to get to places in between here in Denver like Broomfield, Lafayette, those kind of places. Those transport buses offered that great connection in Longmont to make those happen. But obviously, with RTD service being limited, it's not quite the case anymore. And we're trying to get some of that bus service back. But they are, and and I can get that information too. They are monitoring their customers. They do a really great job, actually, of talking to their customers about what the needs are. So we'll talk to them and see what kind of bus service they're talking about coming back and when. Okay. Yeah, because it's pretty limited right now. So. Thanks for the presentation. I know you're presenting this on behalf of them, so um, if you don't have the, the answers, no sweat. Um, but how's the involvement with the City of Longmont and the Flex Partnership complement or conflict with RTD services? And is there any discussions to further integrate these services together uh, so there's more regional connectivity? Right. I, we kind of talked about that in that last question about the idea that before there was a great connecting point at Ethan Kaufman to uh, Get to other services and our thought is in the future and in, in 2027 hopefully once we build out the first and main station that we'll have all the kind of transit activity mm -hmm. happen at that location and so the flex bus will go there on its way to boulder uh the the ld buses that were once pretty uh pr pretty robust in their service between here and, and denver will come back at some level. We are working with RTD to come to bring back the direct buses from Longmont to downtown Denver. They won't run as expresses initially, but they will at least run to downtown Denver, which is great. And then those buses to Boulder, and we're talking about getting buses out east as well on 119. So looking at that next phase of the 119 corridor, we've done a lot of work from here to Boulder, and you're gonna see a lot of that construction coming in the next couple months here. 
the next piece of it is to look out to the east and get to the tri-towns uh, there too. But I don't know if that really answers your question, but it is the idea of kind of bringing all those things together in, in one transit hub in Longmont and trying to really be that base. Is there a good coordination between the, the different services to line services? So if somebody's trying to go from Fort Collins to Denver, they can get on, I don't know if Bustang is ever going to come here, but will there be coordination between routes and schedules to align so somebody's you know uh, transferring pretty seamlessly? So RTD does attend those meetings that we have on a quarterly basis with Flex Bus folks, and so they are involved with the interlining of those buses and making sure that as the Flex gets there and if there's transfers that need to be made, uh, their buses are, you know, that five minutes behind so sure. that they can make those connections. Um, but you have to do it the other way as well, right? So they're trying to work. To, they do a lot of uh, uh, communication between the two groups to make sure that they're working together. And as one changes some routes and those timings, the other one uh, can react. Super. Great. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Alrighty, I'm back. Um, so, Cam, we kind of talked about this earlier. Um, it's kind of a small vision, small slash big Vision Zero update um, for our, uh, safety improvements for all roadway users. Um, so, city staff were, uh, successfully attained a federal funded grant, uh, we learned just kind of like last week, um, for a total of $1.5 million. Uh, with 20% of city match, so that's $300,000. Um, a great uh, reason for this is we're looking at creating a um, safety or an action plan for Vision Zero um, with help of a consultant. Um, so that money that is for the $350,000 was potentially something that we would have to eat regardless. Um, so basically, we got more bang for our buck than we would have if we've not applied for this grant. Along with that is another intersection uh, site distance study um, to evaluate our site distance, stopping site distance, and um, updating our parking and development standards for um, site distance on our intersections. Um, and then the big portion of it is smart technology uh, demonstration pilot for $900,000. Um, that includes um, procurement of equipment, installation, as well as um, consultant services to help us go through some of that data and create a um, report and then look at how we can change um, our signalization options and uh, roadway signage to maybe increase uh, safety across um, these intersections that we select for all uh, road users. <clears throat> um, so the smart technology demonstration portion is to deploy a system called DERC um, to 10 intersections in Longmont. Uh, we haven't nailed down which intersections we want, but you could probably assume majority of them. Um, so I'm a firm believer that when someone issues a um, concern or calls us about, hey, I almost got hit by a car or had to jump out of the way, I, I, would, I love to believe everyone I can talk to, um, but it's really hard without, well, unless you ha didn't have proof of it, I don't know if it actually happened, so it makes it really hard to make you know, a real change. Um, this system records and detects um, near-miss incidences between vehicles and vehicles, vehicles on peds, uh, vehicles on bikes, bikes and peds, um, as well as some other uh, safety evaluations. Um, this allows us to evaluate um, intersection safety and make changes proactively versus waiting for someone to get hit. Um, so, so remember the spelling, it's D-E-R-Q. Most people get that wrong. So if you ever see some um, news reports or other updates, it's D-E-R-Q, not D-I-R-K, or another spelling, D-E-R-Q. Um, so we're start off a little strong. Um, I will alert you to any potential um, distressing videos, but these ones, um, no ones are hitting these videos. This is explicitly uh, near miss detection. So top left, it detects a car right there, pedestrian on the bottom right in blue, making a flashing yellow turn. 
does not see the pedestrian, pedestrian has to veer out of the way. This is a great example is this happens every day at every intersection, but the issue is we don't know when it happens and that is not reported unless someone calls us and it's still a hearsay statement. Here's another one at night. Similar set setup, taking a left, same corner, doesn't see pedestrian with their dog and has to move out of the way. Um, potentially a person who doesn't move as well, can't jump out of the way, so a less attentive driver may have hit this person. Got another nighttime. Um, another thing is decided to go out on the road. This is why I like pressing the button. Um, person will stand at the corner for some time and then decide they wanted to go. Um, you know, it's unfair to people in all situations. The person doesn't deserve to be hit, but also it's great to have some um, notification of who is crossing and when they're crossing, whether it's early or late in the cycle. Uh, last one, daytime, taking a right. And pedestrian comes from a shaded area behind, potentially by the pole, but the vehicles are usually looking for uh, people in the crosswalk, not behind them. So um, this is good you know, support for additional measures to improve safety. Um, in addition to this, uh, bicycle incident protection. Um, for bicyclists, it does give back uh, more enhanced information, such as speed and direction, as well as car vehicle and direction. So where's the... There it is. So sorry if it's hard to read from your guys' side. Um, but classify passenger car going 10 miles per hour, making a left turn uh, south, going eastbound, with the bicyclist going through in the southbound direction. And another one. Oh, whoops. I love PowerPoint. There we go. Um, all right, this is a bicyclist going against the light. So in instances where we get told, hey, I almost got hit on my bike. Someone was going through the light. I had the green. No, cross driving did. So it's a good informational piece of maybe there's not information for people crossing that they need to wait. Um, another nighttime scenario, taking the left on a flashing yellow arrow, walking the bike across, a little late in the cycle, but then a stop and even the, per the second person past that person does not see an uh, individual in the crosswalk. Bicycle's going fast. Even a person checked there before if anyone's waiting across, um, it's very hard to see. And that scenario, person taking the left also is trying to cut a gap. So look at the distance between when they're turning and in potential impacts to cars. Um, maybe they make that turn and they get hit. Person gets side because they took a, to a left. But reports fail to say that there's a bicyclist that went against the light. Um, so it gives us police and um, us engineers more information about why things happen the way they do. Uh, another great thing is wrong way detection. Unless you're there, you do not see it. Um, and it happens more than you think. Um, taking a left, this is a concrete divided intersection. So there's no way to cross. Um, that's at 5.35 a.m. <laughs> Still going. Um, let's see. This one is at night at almost 4 a.m. I don't trust my clicker anymore. So late at night and going pretty decently fast. There we go. Went through the left turn lane thinking it was a straight lane. Um, yeah. Uh, here's another one. Um, let's see. Going through, and the light turns red. So impatient driver goes around the front car who correctly stops to make a left turn, while if you notice in the bottom part of the screen, there are pedestrians waiting to cross. So potentially that would have turned green, um, 
as people are still crossing the road. And this is one of my favorites. Um, this is from when I was demoing this, this equipment um, back in my previous um, city in North Glen, Colorado. Uh, it's at Huron 104th. This is a police chase at uh, about noon. I think it was, it was a weekday. First car is the guy running, the rest are police, police in pursuit. So when it comes to scene recreation and maybe training for um, police officers or any law enforcement, may, I, I don't know the protocols, but I don't know if it's the best way to catch people, but um, it does make good learning moments for you know everyone involved. Um, oh, now it works. Um, here, a fun one, red light violations. Um, so these actually connect to our traffic controllers and it can share the uh, signal phase status for the signal heads as well as the um, pedestrian buttons. Um, so it'll know when the walk is on or the uh, solid hand is on. Um, this tracks time in red. So once the light turns red, it'll actually track how long that vehicle um, crossed the intersection while it was in red, um, as well as speed and direction. So the first one is 74 miles per hour at four, almost five o'clock. It'll light them up. So yellow, top right, so it's a color, red, through the intersection. Is that 17th of Maine here? Yes. yes. So 17th of Maine. Um, this is a demo for a few months. Um, and that's part of this grant, is we provide this information of what we're getting back so we could attain this grant. About 10, minutes. 10 minutes, okay. Not using your nope, this is separate. So you see right here it's red. Uh, 22 seconds in red, 19 miles per hour. So not be going fast, but very red. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see, this is icy road conditions, 6 a.m. Straight through, th almost three seconds in red, going 37 miles per hour. And this is 50 miles per hour going southbound. And we got a couple people too. So it actually captured all the vehicles that were turning red, but you can see it's yellow right now, and this person's all the way back here. So when we're talking about future enforcement options or uh, station patrols, we can provide this information with the context to see when and how often it happens. Why not red light camera? Um, we are working on talking with PD and some possible options. Um, you'll hear some new information here soon. Um, so this is crash detection. This is also North, this one's in North Glen. This is a great one that doesn't get detected. So these guys have a green arrow turning left. Bicyclist comes in and almost gets hit twice. But these are reports that are never reported back to PD, AKA to us. Uh, this is 17th and Maine again, icy conditions. And then similar thing, icy conditions, going south, uh, it doesn't bother to stop. And so we're conducting investigations. It makes it a lot easier to say who's, who's that wrong. Um, I will, I think this is the one I'm thinking about. If you don't wanna see some distressing footage, no one was killed, but um, this is a great video of what it can check for bicyclists. Um, I feel okay more showing this one because the person in the bike actually just stole this bike from the gas station and is running away. He's at the top right. And vehicles just got a green. And he, he was okay. But, um, you know, it gives context to the person who invertly hit somebody because there was no scenario where they could possibly see him with the truck blocking their view when they had the green indication. Um, I'll go through these fast uh, because it's analytics. So day of week, when they happen, what direction they happen, what lane they happen in, um, month by month, quarter by quarter, week by week, uh, before and afters. 
Uh, so we're making changes. We can do that. We can filter by lanes, type of hits. So it's cutoff, rear end, lane change, broadside, east, west, south, through, left, right, all that good stuff. Uh, heat maps and location, so we can see when it's happening. Uh, another great feature is more counting and classification. So it brings up redundancy to our system so we can verify our data is correct. And if we have two data sets that are good and one that's um, can be thrown out, we know which one's wrong and make corrections. So we're working with good data that's scrutinized. Um, loading, multiple counts. It'll also count bicyclists and pedestrians at intersections and their, um, what time of day too. And speed compliance, so it'll track speed and track over speeding. So you can see how fast people go. So zero to nine over, 10 to 14, 15 to 19, uh, 15 to 39, sorry, this is actual speeds, not over speeds. Um, and then you see what percentage people are 40, 49, and 50 plus. Um, so that's that Dirk system that we're bringing to 10 um, intersections of the city. Sorry, I was a little fast trying to beat the clock, but um, happy to answer, answer any quick questions. Thanks for that presentation. That was intense. Um, so there's a lot of data that you get with this, but what is the actionable items once you have this data? Like what, what can you do to improve any of this? So the biggest problem we have when we make signal changes is there's going to be populations for and against it. And so when we're bringing these changes to our intersections that may be significant and alter how people navigate through Longmont, we're providing that context and that information. So this is the backup for implementing new change? So, yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, what does Dirk stand for? Uh, it's just Dirk. It's oh. just a name. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay, um, great. Thank you for all the information, Kyle and um, Transport Phil. And uh, we can go to comments from board members. Um, I'll start on this end. Yes, great discussion. And I got to check out Spring Gulch too, and it was amazing. Oh, okay. I was too busy living the, my best life. So, uh, yeah, it was, yeah. And also, yeah, I saw other people, uh, obviously not closely on if they were familiar faces, but, uh, yeah, there was, uh, but I, yeah, I was pleasantly surprised to see that people are already on the trail and, um, yeah, yeah, it looks really nice. So, uh, if you have not had a chance to check it out, please do. Otherwise, yeah, that's all for me. Uh, again, great presentations. Uh, is there going to be a ribbon cutting for Spring Gulch Trail? And, uh, you know, pu publish it in the paper and... Okay. Okay. All right. Good Good to know. And then, uh, and then kind of one uh, announcement for the group is uh, another group I'm involved in. We have invited uh, the founder of Strong Towns uh, this Thursday, September 12th uh, at 6 p.m. at the heart of Longmont Church. Uh, so please come. It'll be talking about housing, uh, their new book. Um, I invite all and staff to come. But uh, there is going to be a $5 charge, but the money will go to the townhome project that the church is building. So thank you. A um, couple of things. So I got to attend the transportation summit. Um, well, I don't know. Whenever it was, a couple of weeks ago, what, I, three <laughs> last. I don't know. Whenever it was, um, and that's always interesting to kind of see the broader picture of what the state is planning on doing. And obviously, their focus was on rail, so that's always a um, exciting but disappointing subject at the same time. Because it's often similar story to last year. Was we really wanted to make it happen, but we're about fifteen steps away. So. Um, it's it's good to attend though, because then at least you kind of 
learning about the process and seeing a little bit behind the scenes of what actually goes on into making these projects actually come to fruition. And my other um, comment is that um, I'm organising an event as part of my job, but um, it's all about transportation and home electrification. Uh, it's called Electrify Lomont. It's being sponsored by the city and transportation department will be there as well as um, being sponsored by sustainability and LPC. So if you are interested in attending, it's going to be on October 6th, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. at the fairgrounds. So it's going to be all about electrification, EVs, e-bikes, solar panels, all everything you can think about that uses electric will be there. So. I also want to thank uh, staff for the presentations. Very informative. No further questions. Um, <laughs> uh, same. I'd like to just um, call out. I really appreciate seeing the videos, too, of these incidents because I work from home, so I really don't like see how bad you all are driving. And <laughs> it's like really surprising to me. but. And I, I really appreciate it. And um, I was just at Fort Collins for the first time, and I really liked it, too. And now, knowing about Transport, I was like, oh, I'll, I'll go back again now. So thank you. Thank you for all the presentations, and I know that was a lot to get through. Um, I'm not, biking is not my main mode of transportation. Uh, it's car, bus, walking. Um, you all inspired me to get on my bike more, and I started going on the Greenway, and it's amazing. And I'm really proud of the infrastructure that we have, and uh, like you all, I, I want to continue to build on what we have, but um, thanks for that inspiration to get me back on a bike, and uh, hopefully my kids will get on a bike some sometime soon when I'm a little bit more comfortable with uh, Vision Zero kind of coming to fruition and uh, things being a little bit more safer. Uh, I don't want to be on any of those videos that you demonstrate in the future, so, but thank you all. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for all the information and the presentations. I'm, I'm really struck by the fact that um, since I've been here, we've really moved from, I won't say single mode, but um, we've really started to embrace a variety of modes of transportation uh, or mobility, really, uh, more importantly. And I think that's a, a great move by us, by the city, um, and, and kind of celebrating that. So that's all I want to say. Um, thank you, everybody, for, for all your comments. And since uh, Council Member Yarbrough is not here, we can move on to our items for the upcoming agenda, uh, which is scheduled for October 14th, would be the microtransit kickoff and the, ooh, the vaulted crash report. We sure we're on schedule for that, Phil? We think we are, yes. <laughs> <laughs> there has been a request to move it to the next week, but I don't know. I, I think we'll just keep this at our regular second Monday. Yeah. But there has been a request uh, if we could move it to the third Monday, but I. For uh, October? Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, if people already have conflicts, if there's not going to be a lot I of I have folks, a conflict. I okay. won't be here. I will also not be here. <laughs> what would you think about going to the 21st? <laughs> that is good. But does, that, does the I mean, 21st for work me. for everybody? Oh, dang it. Because I'll be returning from Gina's homeland <laughs> that day. Well, so, that, that weekend. so we want to look at then October 21st. Yes, if that works for everybody, we would okay. appreciate that change, and I'll make that change. If any the, board board members find that it's a conflict, maybe just shoot an email to, to Diane, and then that way we can coordinate what the responses would be. Yeah. we got to make sure Di Diane can make it, too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Are you there? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay. All right. So we've gotten that. Um, oh, do we need to do a motion to change the date? Do we need to make a motion to change the date, Phil? That would be wonderful. If okay. Could. If I can get a motion to change the date to October 21st for the next meeting. I will motion to change our next meeting date to October 21st from the 14th. And if I could get a second. Second. <laughs> All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, great. Um, and then last, uh, we just have to get a movement to adjourn and we can call it a night. 
A uh, motion to adjourn tonight's meeting. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.